Matthew chapter 5. Please open it to Matthew chapter 5. Which is where you find the start of the Sermon on the Mount. And the passage that we're going to look at tonight is verses 17 to 20. And it is a very complicated passage. Um, I really stressed and sweated over this in my preparation. So if I have to stress and, stress and sweat, then so do you. Because it's, yeah, we need to get to grips with this passage. So I want to introduce the, the Old Testament law to you. Because in this passage, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the Old Testament law and its role in a Christian's life, as it were. So the people who lived under the Old Covenant, in other words, before Jesus came, they referred to the Old Testament, not as the Old Testament, of course, for them it was just the covenant. They referred to it as the law, the prophets, and the writings. So the law referred to the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, all written by Moses, and then the prophets would refer to most of the major and minor prophets, and then the writings, that was the extra stuff like Psalms, Proverbs, and funnily enough, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. And when it comes to the law, how many, who here knows how many laws there were in the Old Testament that the people had to keep? Anyone want to hazard, hazard a guess? 680. Uh, very close chat, 613. Here they are. There were 77 thou shalt. And 194 thou shalt not. 26 commandments were for people only living in Israel. Some were time-related commandments. In other words, if you were doing this activity at this time, then you needed to do or don't do this particular thing. And then some of the 613 laws of the Old Testament were just for certain people. Maybe the priests, maybe they applied to women, maybe they applied to men. When you think of the law of the Old Testament. When did God's law begin? You might think, well, the Ten Commandments. No, there, was, there, was, there were laws before the Ten Commandments. Even Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they were, they were given a commandment. You can do what you like here, Adam and Eve, but do not eat from that one tree. When Cain killed Abel and committed murder, he was breaking the law of God. That was prior to the Ten Commandments. So I'm just making the point that even before the Ten Commandments were given, even before all the Mosaic laws were given, which are contained in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, there were still commandments. And these commandments governed every single aspect of a person's life. There were laws telling you what kind of haircut you could have, which is the same situation in North Korea, by the way. I think there are about six official haircuts for men. Uh, but the Jews of the Old Testament, there were laws about haircuts. You were not allowed to cut the sides of your, your hair and, and you had to grow your beard. There were, of course, criminal laws. Uh, there were social laws, uh, laws governing sexuality, laws about morality and ceremonial laws. Here's another little picture of some uh, Jewish boys. And this is not kind of staged. If you walk around Jerusalem today, you'll find entire little schools and, and guys kicking soccer balls around on the street. And believe it or not, they all look like this. Because the kind of people that choose to live in the old city of Jerusalem are pretty devout. So we need to ask ourselves, what, what was the purpose of all of these laws? All of these 613 laws? Basically, these laws showed the people how God wanted them to be living. So, these laws were given because these, these ways of doing things pleased God. Many of the laws were teaching aids. In other words, wash this pan like this, uh, prepare the meal this way, this thing must be done like this. These laws were designed to, to teach people the ways of God, what's pure, what's not pure, and the like. Some of the laws that were given were for health and welfare. For example, the Jews were not allowed to eat pork, and some people would say, well, that was for the sake of their health back in the day. There were also building regulations. 
Uh, we think, gee, if you do a building today, there's so many rules and regulations. Well, uh, in the Old Testament, there are rules about building regulations. If you have a flat roof or any roof, you had to have a parapet around it uh, so that people wouldn't fall off and injure themselves. There were also rules designed to form a just society, and this has relevance for us today in South Africa. There were rules about restitution. There were rules about what you needed to do when people got into debt, and so much debt that they couldn't get out of it. And that's where there were the commands about uh, the year of Jubilee and the like. There were uh, rules for success in life, and I think of the Sabbath. How many of us are resting one full, complete day a week? That was a command in the Old Testament. Even farming was governed by rules and regulations in the Old Testament. For example, if you had a, had a field, you need to not farm on it for every seventh year to give the ground also time to recover and to recuperate. And there were laws, oh dear, I've just been told my battery is running low. That is very worrying when you're actually plugged in. <laughs> um, okay. Not too sure what to do about that. Um, there were laws about our, our psychological well. Whoop, okay, that's gone now. Johnny, can you take over, please? Because you've got a copy of this. Are you going to be able to do that? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Now we're really going to be putting Johnny to the test tonight. Because <laughs> timing is everything, Johnny. <laughs> so there, there were laws about... Um, the, the, the part of the laws of God that were given in the Old Testament were there to establish group identity. Things like the festivals, the practice of circumcision and the like. Um, and so these laws were, were a big deal for the Jewish people. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees, their whole job in life was to fulfill these laws and to teach other people to fulfill the laws. And if there weren't enough laws, if 613 commandments and laws were not enough, um, they used to invent further laws. Uh, and I've used this example before, but if God's law said you cannot come within five meters of a particular thing, hypothetically, then the Pharisees would make a new law and they would say you cannot come within ten meters of a thing. That was to protect you even from getting the chance of breaking God's law. Um, even today, there's some weird and wonderful examples. Uh, there's, there are metal detectors, uh, for example. Can I have a picture of that, please, John? There we go. Um, so this, this sign is outside the entrance to the Temple Mount, and it basically assures everybody that if you go through this metal detector on the Sabbath, that you will not break the Sabbath law. Because you know in an electric switch, even a light switch, when you click it, there's that tiny little spot, you know, just as things connect. Ever seen that? Uh, well, the Jews regard that, the very orthodox Jews regard that as doing work because technically you're making a fire. So even uh, switches and things have to be designed in such a way as to not break uh, the Sabbath laws. Here's uh, an example of a lift. Uh, many lifts in Israel will have the Sabbath switch. Okay, there it is, a little key on the lift. Um, and this is so that people wanting to use the lift on the Sabbath do not have to to break the law against doing work on the Sabbath by pushing the switch. So many Jews will rather climb down the stairs than push the button because technically that's less work and you're allowed to walk a certain distance. And so the Sabbath list, when you set it on Sabbath, um, then it will automatically stop on every floor. So there's no button pushing required. It just takes a jolly long way to get wherever you want to go. Okay, so they invent extra laws, like the metal detector law and the Sabbath and the lift law. Um, and so in addition to the 613 laws, there were all these other laws, and it became a massive weight on people to obey these laws. And I haven't even touched on the laws about the feasts, the sacrificial system, and the like. 
And when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, all of the sacrificial offerings were taking place in the temple. The Day of Atonement was being practiced. Every single one of the 613 laws was being practiced. Right, so that is the introduction to the sermon. Do you all have an understanding? Some of you were thinking, gee, that should be the end by now. <laughs> this this gives you a, a taste of what the Old Testament law was all about and how all-encompassing it was uh, and, and the effect on people's lives. Right, let's read from the Sermon on the Mount. Here we go. Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So how many of you are going to be entering the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, it's a bit of a shocker when you read these verses. I mean, it really does see that Jesus, in the midst of all this law keeping, is saying, well, I've not come to get rid of the law. I've, I've come to fulfill the law. And your righteousness better exceed that of the, the scribes and the Pharisees. Surely Jesus is not saying we need to be eating a kosher diet, practicing circumcision, and sacrificing animals. And so there is this tension between what Jesus teaches here in the Sermon on the Mount and what we as Christians believe and practice and, and what, what Christians have, have taught for, for centuries. So what are, this, what's, what are some of the solutions to this conundrum that we find ourselves in between what it appears Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and with what Christians have long practiced. So some people say, well, what's recorded here is incorrect. Matthew, when he was writing down the Sermon on the Mount, he kind of left out a word. Jesus said, you do have to obey the law. Um, no, Jesus said, you don't have to obey the law, but then Matthew just thought he said, you do have to obey the law. Okay, so that, that's a possible solution that we can throw out. Other people have suggested, well, Jesus is just talking to Jews here. He, this is before his death on the cross. These are people living under the old covenant. So Jesus is kind of adjusting his message and saying, look, you're all living under the old covenant. So this is what we need to be doing. But that can't be the solution to our predicament. Because in verse 18, Jesus specifically says, no, this law is going to stand until the heavens and earth pass away. And as you can see, that's not happened yet. Others have suggested it's just the moral law that Jesus is referring to that, that still stands today. The moral law, you know, things like don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. The problem with that interpretation is that the Old Testament doesn't make a distinction between moral laws and other laws. That law about building a parapet around your flat roof. I mean, there's morality in there. You're, you're putting up a parapet so people don't fall and hurt themselves. That's a moral thing to do. And so it's not so easy to say, no, Jesus is just upholding the moral law. Some have said, well, it's just the Ten Commandments that Jesus is referring to. The only problem with that is that there's no indication in the passage that Jesus is talking about the Ten Commandments. And even when it comes to the Ten Commandments, Christians don't really keep the Sabbath in the sense of, and in the way that the Jews did. And then, of course, there's the solution to say, well, the easiest solution is simply to recognize that Christians do need to keep the Old Testament law. But that's not my understanding either. But we've had people, one or two people in our church, 
that have actually moved on from our church because they've come to the conclusion that they do need to obey every all of the Old Testament laws. The Seventh-day Adventists, for example, teach that we need to observe a, a kosher diet, we need to worship on a Saturday, and, and keep much of the Old Testament law. The problem with saying, though, that Christians do have to obey the Old Testament law is that we can't pick and choose which ones we're going to obey. Jesus talks about the jot and the tittle. The, the jot or the yot on the left, that is the smallest little letter or, or marking in the Hebrew language. It's a little bit like an apostrophe S on a word. Or the size of a dot on an I. The tittle is that little tail thing at the bottom of the beth. You see that there? The, the one, uh, of course you can see it. There's an arrow pointing to it. <laughs> that's a tittle, that little thing there. That's a tittle. And Jesus is saying here, guys, not one little jot or tittle can be taken away from the Old Testament law. God's word is so sacred that you can't mess with it. You can't make changes. You can't tweak it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, not one jot or tittle will, will pass away. It, it, it stands. So what are we to do as Christians? How are we to resolve this problem? And how can we have a righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees? Jesus says in verse 20, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The Old Testament taught the law of tithing. That, that if you farmed something, the first 10% of your crop, you needed to bring that into the temple and give it to the Levites and the priests who worked there and it would be used for them and distributed to the poor. That was the law of tithing. The Pharisees took tithing so seriously that if in their herb garden they happened to pluck a little bit of mint or, or even some spices, there they are, mint, dill and cumin, um, they would make sure that they took a tenth of their harvest to the temple. I mean, can you imagine the logistical problems? A guy, you know, pass the offering bag. Okay, here's the bag for mint. Um, here's the bag for pepper granules. I mean, this was seriously the, the degree to which they took it. And so Jesus says, woe to you Pharisees. You give a tenth of your spices. But you've neglected the more important aspects of the law. You should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, etc., without neglecting the former. And so even this law of tithing, Jesus regards as, as a good and, and godly thing. So what are we to do? Just one other observation that relates to this problem. When the church began, pretty much everybody was Jewish. And so it wasn't a problem to stick to a kosher diet, to take Saturday off, um, and to do all the Jewish stuff to keep your cool looking hair cut. You know, that's, that's just what people did. I mean, that was who they were, and they were happy to go and obey the law. But as the church grew and spread through missionary work, more and more people that were not Jewish started becoming Christians. And they didn't want to give up their, their pork chops and their cheeseburgers, which are also against the Mosaic law. Because you can't mix malt and meat. There's a law about that. And, and so this tension grew in the, the early church between the Gentiles who didn't want to obey the Old Testament law and the people that obeyed the law was the most natural and obvious thing to do because it was part of their culture. And the church nearly split over this issue. And even Peter, the guy Jesus had put in charge of the church, fell for this deception. And even Peter started telling people that they needed to obey the Old Testament law. The way they resolved this problem was to have a big conference. That's always what Christians do when there's a problem. Yeah. And that conference uh, is recorded in Acts chapter 15. 
And there all the leaders got together because some people had come down and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And we see that Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas got into sharp dispute with these people. And so they said, look, everybody needs to go up to Jerusalem and try and sort out this problem. And, and there were some people who were Pharisees. Next slide. There were Pharisees, okay, who'd become Christians. And these people were also saying, verse 5, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And so the people got together to, to discuss this issue. And in verse 10, Someone with a wise head stands up and says, Why, folks, are you trying to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? That's their way of saying, Why are we as Jewish people trying to force Gentiles to live under the weight of these 613 laws? When we ourselves know jolly well, we've not been able to keep them. And it's been a massive burden to us. But it wasn't just a pragmatic solution. They say, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. And not by obeying the law. Here's another example. The Apostle Paul, after being an apostle for 14 years, had a revelation in inverted commas. Okay, take away here, sometimes we think God has spoken to us and shown us something, and it's not God. Okay, it was just us. Worst case scenario, sometimes it's a demon. Anyway, so Paul has this revelation, this realization, he suddenly thinks, oh my goodness, for the last 14 years I've been preaching the wrong gospel. I've been telling people they don't have to obey the Mosaic law, and now I've just had this revelation, and I've realized that they do have to obey the law. Oh, oh, actually, maybe they don't. So Paul's all confused, and he's unsure about this. So he decides the best way to resolve the problem is to, to secretly and privately go up to Jerusalem and to have a little chat. And he goes to the people in the middle of the page. He does it privately to those who are leaders. For fear that I was running or had run my face, race in vain. And he is told, thankfully, verse 15 of Galatians 2, No, we know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So the New Testament and the apostles are crystal clear on this issue. That Christians do not have to live under the Jewish law. Which brings us back to the problem of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus seems to be saying that the law is here to stay and it's relevant. So how do we get ourselves out of this predicament? I've got a suggestion for us. Here we go. Verse 17 of Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What are some key words here? Firstly, the word abolish. Let's look at that. In the Greek language, it's the... There's a slide for this. In the, next slide, please. It, this Greek word for abolish, it means to destroy. It was used of the temple being, being destroyed by the Romans. It can mean to, to overthrow. And in a legal sense, it can mean to in invalidate. So when Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, he's making it clear, I'm not here to get rid of the law, to invalidate the law, to, to denigrate the law, to throw it out. He says, I've come to fulfill the law. 
He could have said, I've come to keep the law. I've come to do the law. I've come to obey the law. He doesn't. He says, I've come to fulfill the law. And not just the law. He says, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. What does it mean that Jesus has fulfilled the law? Because this is our solution to understanding how we should interpret Jesus' words here in the Sermon on the Mount. What does it mean that he has affirmed the law? Number one, Jesus affirms the value of the Old Testament law. As Christians, we should hold the law of the Old Testament in high regard. And I always get very disturbed when I hear Christians speaking ill of the Old Testament. Oh, look how savage they were back then. All that killing and all the ridiculous things that people used to do. Oh, and those silly little laws about do that and don't do that. What was Moses thinking? That shouldn't be our attitude at all. Jesus says we need to hold the law with the highest of respect and remember that not a jot or a tittle can be taken from the law of the Old Testament. Paul, even in Romans, writes about how much he delights in God's law. There's a verse for that, John, Romans 7 verse 12. I delight in God's law. That's the Christian attitude. So what does it mean that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets? It means too that Jesus is what the law and the prophets point to. When Jesus says, I've not come to get rid of the law and the prophets, he's referring to more than just commandments. He's referring to the law and the prophets. And he says, I've not come to get rid of all that. I've come to fulfill it. He's saying, I am what the law and the prophets point to. And we see this very clearly in Jesus' discussion on the road to Emmaus. We're told that starting with Moses and all the prophets, he showed them what was said in the scriptures. You see again that phrase, in Moses, that's the law, and the prophets, they all talk about Jesus. Secondly or thirdly, I've lost track and I'm muddled. Here's the next point. Jesus also fulfilled the law by showing us the true meaning of the law. Its real purpose. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? The rabbis used to, it, it's not murder. <laughs> Back a bit. <laughs> The rabbis used to, to debate what's the greatest commandment and what's the least important one. They thought that the greatest commandment, and, and I think it's a great idea, is honor your father and mother. And they thought that the least commandment was the one that tells you to look after a female bird well. They asked Jesus the question, what is the greatest commandment? And he didn't give them the answer they wanted to hear. He said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And then he said, and the second is right up there with it. It's to love your neighbor just like you love yourself. And then he says in verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, if you can get this stuff right, you love God with all of your heart. And you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, then, then all of these other commands will be fulfilled. So Jesus brings out the true meaning of the law. For example, when it comes to murder, the law might have spoken about murder, but the real issue is anger. You see, Jesus took that law about murder and he showed no, it's not just about you can't go out and kill people. You actually mustn't be angry and hateful to other people. The law spoke about adultery. Do not commit adultery. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus says, no, no we can do it. The real actual thing behind that is you mustn't even lust after a person. 
When it comes to making an oath, there are all sorts of laws about making oaths, and I promise this and I swear by that, and now you must believe me. Jesus says, no, no, no. That law is actually about being a person of integrity. Let me explain it to you this way. I'll use a running metaphor. The Old Testament said, again, this is not really what the Old Testament says, it's a hypothetical example. I don't want to make it 614 laws. The Old Testament, for example, said you must run a half marathon. Jesus says, I'm changing that. You must now run a marathon. So he hasn't got rid of the old law, because if you fulfill the new law he's established, you will find that halfway to fulfilling his law, you will have fulfilled the Old Testament law anyway. Here's another question for you. If you had to pick a way of salvation, what would you find it easier to do? To obey the 613 laws of the Old Testament, or to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? I'd go with the 613 laws, because that is a lot easier than loving everybody else as much as you love yourself. I mean, have you ever tried that? It's really hard. Jesus also fulfilled the law for us. He shed new light on the law. St. Augustine of Hippo explained it this way. There's a slide for this. Jesus obeyed the law. He fulfilled the messianic predictions. He empowered his people to obey the law. He brought out the true meaning of the law. He explained the true meaning of the rituals and the ceremonies. And he gave additional commands to further bring out the intention of the law. That's how Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't abolish it, get rid of it. He came to raise the bar. And to fulfill everything that the law pointed to. Let's jump to the slide of the message translation. Here's Eugene Peterson's take on this passage. Don't suppose for a minute I've come to demolish the scriptures. By the way, Andy Stanley said a month or two ago that we need to unhitch the Old Testament from our faith. It was a bit of a stir. Do not think I've come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to pull it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky, the ground at your feet. Long after the stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law and you'll have only have trivialized yourself. Take it seriously. Show the way for others. And you will find honor in the kingdom. To bring this all together and wrap it up. Jesus is teaching us here to, to, to love and to honor the Old Testament law. It's not up for amendment. But rather all that he taught took that law further. But mercifully, we're no longer under the jurisdiction of the Old Testament law. It's a wonderful law. It's, it's great, but we're not going to be judged by it anymore because of our relationship with Christ. Let me just jump to the very end and, and wrap this up. Let me just end with Jesus' words in verse 20 where he says, in Matthew 5, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The people must have shaken their heads and thought that if the scribes and Pharisees aren't doing the law right, what hope is there for us? And the gospel is all about a new way of righteousness. This series is called A New Way to Live. Well, the new way of righteousness comes to us not through our own effort in obeying all of the laws God's given us. It comes through believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, and fulfilling the great laws that He gave to us. 
Romans 3 verse 20 says this, and then I'm done. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by His grace. Let's pray together, and while we're praying, the worship team is welcome to come onto the platform. Lord, help us to have a good perspective on the Old Testament and its laws and its commandments. Thank you that all of the Old Testament, all of the prophets, point to you, Jesus. That you are the fulfillment to everything they were building up to and to all that the law hoped to accomplish. You were it, Lord. And we thank you that we don't have to bear this heavy yoke of, of slavish law keeping. Thank you that you give us new hearts in the kingdom of God. That you write your laws on our hearts. That you empower us to do what is right and good in your sight. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to earn our righteousness, but it is a gift from you. Rid us from the notion that we can impress you by our good behavior. Help us to see, Lord, that it's only by grace, only by what you've done, that we can be righteous and acceptable in your sight and have a righteousness that exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees. So thank you, Lord, that we are righteous in your sight through our faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you that his blood is the, the atoning sacrifice, that which turns away your wrath propitiation. And thank you, Lord, that we now have your Spirit within us. We love you, Lord. Help us to, to worship you and to, to love you with all of our hearts, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And all God's people said, Amen.